Thanks, Eric. <laughs> uh, guess what? We're recording it. And uh, if, if you don't want to be seen, please, um, please uh, turn your video feed off. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I must acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our lives. And now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Lori Winder is the Executive Director of the Ashbourne. She has a passion for inclusion and the need for creating welcoming spaces for people. Ashbourne was the first seniors community to receive affirming status from the United Church of Canada. Lori hopes that she can encourage other senior residential communities to undertake the work needed to make all seniors communities LGBTQ2S welcoming. We are thrilled to have Lori back to speak to us for a second time. Over to you, Lori. Well, good morning. How is everyone this morning? I'm happy, happy to be here uh, from San Francisco, not really. So I am going to uh, share with you my personal experience um, finding seniors housing for my mom and stepdad. And, uh, it, and it, as, I'm writing, as I'm writing this, I realized how much we went through. So I'm going to share the screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation and that's more for me to keep me on track because I'm a talker and I will ramble. Uh, let's see if I can share with you. I had it up already, so. Okay, all right. So this, um, as you can see what that, that's what I felt like was um, we were overwhelmed by stuff as we went through this process. So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, let me just pass, let me see, move this. This doesn't allow me to move to my next slide. There we go, there we go. All right, so we moved my folks, and here's the here's the troublemakers right here. This is my mom, Esther, and my stepdad, Doug, and they were um, they're lovely people and very kind, but a little bit set in their ways, as you would imagine, at the grand old age of eighty six and ninety one when we started the move. So, when did we know it was time for them to move? Because I think this is important. What I find, it, so I, uh, just to let you know, as executive director, I also wear the hat of uh, being a service provider. So some of what I know is based on my professional experience, and some of it is based on personal experience with those two troublemakers that I just showed you. Um, th so it's a combination of those things, but it comes, this comes more from a personal perspective. We realized, and this is three years ago, more than three years ago, that it was time for a move because my stepdad has had both hips replaced and he would um, not do his exercises properly. And so he ended up being quite immobile with his hips. So when he started to fall over, he didn't have any flexibility to put his foot out and stop it. So he was having frequent falls and that was Probably as those started to increase, we were saying, okay, now we need to do something. We can't keep having you fall down um, because he's not a big man. He's not a small man, but my mom could not lift him. So it required one of us to rush over to lift him, which uh, is potentially dangerous as, you know, if he'd hurt himself. So that, that was one thing. The other thing was they were 86 and 91 years old and a very sedentary, they spent a lot of time in front of the television. They also like to go out for lunch and see friends. So they spent a lot of time in social. And as time passed, so did their friends. At that age, they were losing a lot of their friends. So a lot of their social contacts were um, fading out of the picture. Um, and you know, going through the, the grieving process for them was also difficult. Um, the other piece is my stepdad kept banging into things with his car. And so we had spent a lot of time trying to convince him that he should take a taxi or they should get care for a ride or a senior's driving. That in itself took three years leading up to this. So six years back when he started banging into things. And so we felt it was no longer safe for them to drive. But what happens when you no longer have that? Um, you need to rely on alternate transportation. And they are both Scottish and 
they were, it behooved them to pay for a taxi. So he drove much longer than he should be. Um, and hence the car looked like it uh, was a golf ball by the end of uh, when we actually sold the car. But he, we finally got him to give up when he actually moved. So the other thing is they, my mom has uh, some medical issues that was making them not cook very well or eat nutritious meals. And so they spent a lot of time eating toast um, and tea or, you know, sort of fast food or going out for lunch, which was causing them to, I mean, we were concerned about their nutrition. The other piece was stairs. My stepdad, Doug, was, there was just only four stairs getting into the, the bungalow because we had bought a bungalow for them in Sherwood Park and they'd moved into it about six years prior to this. Um, but even those stairs became difficult for him. The other thing is with the, med as their medical needs increased, their need for assistance. And so it got to be quite um, onerous on the family to take care of those. We did it, we didn't complain, they didn't know that we were like, oh my goodness, we got to go back over to mom's again. And, you know, that she's, she's locked herself out of her iPad or Doug's fallen down or they can't figure how to use the TV remote. So we were, it was a lot of um, extra work as they, and so um, as a family, my siblings and I are like, something's got to give. We don't feel, first of all, that they're, they're actually safe where they are in terms of uh, if he falls, he actually fell one time down the sort of back stairs and got jammed between the door and the stairs and my my husband had to come in through a window to get him and my husband's a big guy he's six foot two and to pick him up and get him up again but again so that was kind of the final fall that made us say we gotta go you gotta go and so they said okay we'll look at it this was about three years ago they'll look at it so what was holding them back um were sort of these pieces here that I want to talk about. So it was fear of change, particularly my stepdad. Once he's settled, don't change anything. So our conversation, but we don't feel like you're safe or you're living your best life, which was part of it because I think that they're both quite social people. And as their the wall started to get closer in and they were less mobile, um, I, I think that that was not good for their mental health. So. But they also had this feeling like, and often people do in seniors housing, that it's like the nursing home or the hospital setting. And, and so, you know, you're going to put us in there, we're just going to die. And so they, these are actually words that came out of their mouths was last stop before the grave. Um, but being, in the, being in, the, in the system, I kind of knew that that wasn't necessarily true, but they needed to, to see it with their, with their own eyes. And they're worried it looks like a hospital. And uh, hopefully most, some of them do, but most of them don't. COVID was a big problem for a lot of people. The, um, the how the how COVID was portrayed in seniors, it, the horrible things happened. Don't get me wrong; it wasn't it wasn't fake. That actually happened. But in terms of assisted living or supported living versus long term care, there was a very different impact in terms of how residents when you have a separate living space or when you're in shared living space. So they were very worried. We're not moving. You know, we all get COVID and. That would be horrible and it would be so the other piece and we'll talk about that a little later when we and, and kind of what the learnings was was the perceived loss of independence and so and i guess that took a lot of sort of thought for them in terms of what what are we giving up what are we gaining and so and initially we started talking about that. They saw this as a lot of loss and not a lot of gain, but we'll talk about um, what happens. They also liked their current home. They had set it up and they're collectors of things. And, and so that everything was done lovely. They had massive furniture um, full of knickknacks and dustables as I call them. And so they liked their, their coziness of their place. And so um, it was, lots and lots of conversations with them about is is this what is it about this this space that you can't have elsewhere and there was there was some things that they couldn't have but overall they could take their precious items and they um but it was again that sort of one step closer to the grave was their mindset and also i'm going to lose my independence after i move which i will explain to you was is not true 
but let's carry on. So how we went about it. So just because, and there's a couple of things we did. And so my sister uh, retired um, the year that they moved, which was last year. They moved last May. So they've been just over a year in their, their new place. And my sister and I took on the, the task of trying to find a place to uh, for them to settle and that they would like. So the first thing we needed to do was decide on a location. And, and the question I'm always asked, why didn't they not move into your building? Well, my two reasons. One was location. I have a, a sibling that lives in Stony Plain. I have a sibling that lives in Cardiff, just out as uh, St. Albert. And I live in Sherwood Park. So this location wasn't really uh, ideal for them. And frankly, I don't want my mom in my workplace. I love my mom, but <laughs> don't need her to say, what are you wearing? You know, <laughs> did, you, did you, the beans were terrible last night. So I really thought, you know, we're just going to get into, we're, we're too much alike and we get into fisticuffs if we, uh, if she was here. So it, it didn't make sense. And I think a bit a conflict of interest there with the staff saying, well, we have to treat her properly. She's the executive director's mom. So anyways, we decided fairly early on that that wasn't an option. So we looked for a location and we sort of landed on, um, North Edmonton, St. Albert. And so they, uh, that's kind of the areas we were looking, although we did look in Sherwood Park. My sister convinced me that they should be closer to her because she's uh, retired. Well, little did she tell me that she was going to leave for six months every year and go south. So she actually moved them further away from me than they were. They were in Sherwood Park with us. Anyways, uh, it's not that bad. But so we, so first thing was location. The second thing is what services and amenities do they offer? And when you're comparing apples to apples, uh, they pretty well tell you they have the same thing. But when you dig a little deeper, they don't necessarily have the same thing. And so the other, the example that um, I learned through my work is seniors don't move easily. Um, and that's okay. So what we needed to find a place is that the care would come to them if their if their medical or their physical or their emotional needs change, the mental health change, so that they would not have to make another move. We wanted this to be their place where they could live out the rest of their life comfortably with the services in place and that they were safe. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that was in place as we went from uh, that they had those kind of things and that their services could ramp up as their skills or so where they live right now they do have a kitchen my mom still wants to cook her idea of cooking in my but she likes to have her her place and they make their lunch and their breakfast and they go to dinner so we have to find out what kind of things they wanted to need what, what kinds of things they needed and also would there be medical assistance available if my stepdad, Doug, had a fall, which he does frequently. He's had about, in the last year, he's had about five or six in there. He, I don't know, he's, he's he's made of rubber because he's never broken anything. We call him Gumby because he, if it, you know that reference, but he falls and sometimes he's like trapped between the bed and the wall. And so they have to come in, but there's always two staff on that can come in and lift him safely. My mom tries, she's four foot 10. And she tries to pick him up and they, they both end up on the floor. And so they have to send three staff to pick them all up because moms try to pick up Doug and they're both lying on the floor, laughing their butts off. Fortunately, not hurt, but it's, it's a fairly regular occurrence. So we needed to make sure those kind of things were in place that they had some kind of call system. So if you fell, they could press a button and people could come. And they do. The other thing was cost is a there's quite a variance in cost and senior living in these kind of places is quite expensive. I don't know if anybody else has ex sort of explored them, but you're looking at anywhere from, for a one bedroom from 2000 a month to 6,000 a month. And so in my world, that's 6,000 is a lot of money. So they had to find something a little bit more affordable, but what we had, and they like, they, they're all about how things look. So both of them grew up in, um, Britain in Scotland during the war and lived on rations and uh, 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 never grew up with much money until probably the kids were out of the house and they could uh, afford things that they wanted. So 
To them, a place that looked fancy or upscale was important. So um, some places are more homey than others. Some are look like a fancy hotel with the you know, sweeping staircases. So we had to kind of find a place that was in their budget, but still looked to them fancy or classy. Highfalutin is some <laughs> So we had to do that. So that was for them that we, because we would take them to less, uh, more home, home-like places that weren't as fancy, and they're like, mm, no, not for us. But they, they managed to settle on a place in St. Albert. So we did a lot of that. My sister and I did a lot, and she, my sister, spent a lot of time on the phone, phoning them and saying, "What do you have? You know, do you have nurses in place? Do you have visiting doctors? Do you have?" So the the questions that we asked, um, she spent a lot of time on the phone talking to people, and then we would set up. Uh, a tour. So two things I'd say about this. If you're a little bit sneaky, drop in if you're looking. Because we did some drop-ins and some people were um, amenable to sort of showing us around by just dropping in. And some people are absolutely not. We only do virtual tours and we only um, do it on appointment. So I think that says a little bit and I'll let you interpret that yourself. Some did not have the aging in place capabilities that we were looking for. Some of them were, you know, if your needs changed, you would have to move into a new building that you would have to leave. For example, if you weren't able to get yourself up and out of bed that you needed a lift or you needed assistance, then say, no, nope, can't do that. So I guess it's really, we wanted to make sure that those aging in place pieces were there so that we wouldn't have to move them again, or they would have to be separated. What happens sometimes if one of a, a set of people, like a, a couple needs to move to a higher level of care, the person can't follow them. And so if you can't get the, the care in where you're at, then you have the potential of two people living separately that don't want to and paying two rent. So we were really very stuck on, we need to have aging in place. We need to be able to get them the care where they need, get them the food, get them. And if needed, we could augment the care by adding some companion care. The other thing we found out where we were looking and I was somewhat, um, it, it took me back a little bit was some of them were such hard sells, you know, like it's, it, and, and I, I don't mean to put down used car salesmen, but it, I'll just use that as an analogy is that some of them were so pushy and and um, was hard sell and you knew things that they were saying were, you know, a little bit, um, eh, a stretching of the truth a little bit because I, I know the organizations, but that, so you had to be careful that you didn't succumb to, that we didn't succumb to hard sell. And so my sister and my, my, my folks, they would say, Ooh, that's really good. Oh, I really like that. And I said, I'd say, Ah, that's lovely, but let's just ask a few more questions. So when we were touring places, so we, we did a lot of research online, and then we started to tour these places, and we took along a checklist, and I, and I was telling, so the, and if anybody wants this checklist, because this, again, is a, there's lots of checklists out there when you visit, but this is kind of um, a checklist that I put together with some of the pieces that Sage offers, but also some things I know from a service provider perspective that you might not think of asking if you weren't in the biz. So I put together that and I'm happy to share that. If anybody wants that, please let me know and I will um, share that with you and, and uh, for $700, just kidding, free. But the other it was, um, I, I spent a fair bit of time putting that together for the last EPSG newsletter, which was, so hopefully that's helpful. So books and stores started, started looking and uh, we saw quite a variance between places in terms of how we were received, whether it was home-like or where, where it was very business-like. And so I had to just sort of step back and let my parents do the observing and just sort of whisper in there, and then when they found out that I was, they say, they say, oh, my daughter's an executive director at a senior's residence. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, we got, I got a very different response. Some of it was, some of it was fine. Some of it was like, 
then they started to talk to me and not my folks. And that really annoyed me. So one of the things is they were asking questions about, oh, so when are you thinking about moving or so forth? Then they would start to direct the question to me. And I was like, hmm. and so my mom and stepdad are quite um, cognitively intact and aware, like they have no trouble answering the question. So why they would ask me. So that, that was a, a little bit that I sort of said to them a couple of times, but you want to ask them, they're the one looking. And so it was, it's having a daughter that works in the business. It was a bit of a hindrance sometimes, but a bit of a help also. Cause I'd ask a question. They go, Ooh, nobody's ever asked that before. And okay. All right. So after we did the tour, they picked a place. Would it be my first pick? No, but it was theirs. And so it had the things that they wanted. It had the look that they wanted. And I could say, okay, it has the amenities within it that they need. It's, it has the potential for aging in place. So would I want to live there? And I think for me, it was more, there's nothing wrong with the building they moved into. It's lovely, but at the location was, uh, different for me anyways so after we went through that they actually chose a place in St. Albert and started to work toward a move and that in itself it's um we talked about downsizing and I believe you have an upcoming session about downsizing so we had moved them into the house in Sherwood Park we bought a bungalow for them in Sherwood Park uh seven years earlier before this whole process started and they were supposedly downsizing. Well, it was a three bedroom bungalow with a garage that was chock-a-block full. They had purchased new stuff. They had said, well, we're gonna take this to the, the bungalow and then we will downsize there. Don't ever fall for that. They'd never do it because they did it to us a second time. <laughs> when we go to move them, they, the, the place that they had chosen, they had um, some of the same things. And I'll give you an example. They had 12 salt and pepper shaker sets and didn't want to give any of them up. And did they have emotional, uh, sentimental value? Absolutely not. They just, the idea of giving things up was very hard for them. And so what you see is face value as, you know, gathering junk or whatever it it was more of them holding on to the past and not wanting to give things up in order to move because it felt like to them and I'm putting a bit of words in your mouth but having conversation with my mom is like but these are our things and we love our things do you use these things no but but there are things Right. So what ended up happening is we spent no word of a lie, probably 10 full days from eight in the morning till nine at night going through and sorting. And what happened would be is say, do you want to keep this? Um, no, we can we can donate that. And so we put it in a box and then we'd say, Okay, here's the keep box. We're keeping this. We come back the next day and the things in the giveaway box had moved to the keep box because they had gone through and going, oh, I really like this. And so what ended up happening is we moved them a second time with way too much stuff. And they are now still sorting a year later, sorting through that stuff. Their storage room is, but you know what? It's their stuff. It's not my stuff. It just was annoying to us, but it is their stuff. And it may give them a sense of um, security to take their things. And so now they're starting to realize they can let go of some of this stuff. But back then it was an endless supply source of, come on, mom, you don't really need 12 salt and pepper shakers, do you? Which ones do you like? Oh, okay. <laughs> my mom's very sweet. She will... Um, agree to something and then because she doesn't want conflict and then later on she'll go and backtrack it so we spent a lot of time with the packing things doing that and things that she had not seen since they moved the last time started to emerge so we finally got them down to a few boxes and moved them but it was uh it, it, it the place is wonderful their place looks great but they also took 
twice as much furniture. They weren't willing to give up furniture. And so we try to squish it in this one bedroom condo. Uh, and they, again, they were tripping. And so tripping hazards for my stepdad were a problem. So they were like squishing in between furniture and stuff. So finally we convinced them, let's sell this stuff, get you smaller stuff. Again, that took a long time. So when you talk about the move, it's not just sort of deciding to go. It's dealing with the emotional piece of it, the the material piece of it. It's 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 a lot, especially people being living in their own home. And so we walked them through that, and my sister and I, uh, like we we can argue, and then later on we we'll, we'll we'll get along. Um, but it's just uh, it was a lot of we need to do this, we need to do this, uh, and then when I get to a year later, I want to tell you where we're at because we did the move there and there and this is what they figured out and I had a conversation with my mom probably about a month and a half ago and she said we're we're finally realizing we're glad we did this and and I'll tell you why because they're eating better they've got really good food at night they had a and so they we know they're eating well at least once a day they're getting you know, vegetables and salads and soups and whatever, they've actually put on the standard um, seniors 10 pounds. So when somebody moves into a senior's residence that uh, having their meals prepared, that there's a standing saying that you, you get the first year 10 pounds. So they've gained that. They're starting to join in to things, which I think because they're very social and their social life had really quite shrunk uh, when they couldn't drive and their friends were packed, uh, passing away they now they're finding um friends and I don't know if they'll ever be their best buds and they'll you know but there's people that they can go down and have a coffee with they've started which I thought was quite funny going to a casino on a regular basis which is unlike my uh folks in terms of they're not gamblers but they really enjoy the outing so and also the fall pickups so our frequent faller Doug he is falling down getting picked up. Sometimes they pick them up both laughing their butts off off the floor because they think it's funny. Um, so they, they get their pickups. They have outings easily accessible to friends. And this is my mom's, there's plentiful gossip. Within a building, it's a small community. It's a village. And so they get, they get a lot of entertainment about what's going on in the building. And guess what happened to Mrs. So-and-so? And did you know that this? And I was like, mm -hmm. so I visit them about once a week. And I usually get the 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 scoop on what's the latest gossip. And they they you can just see them. They light up when they tell you what their neighbors are doing and who did something in the dining room. So the other thing is we have is a, a peace of mind for the the three with there's three of us, three daughters and a son. My one uh, sister lives away, but peace of mind for us because we know that if they fall down or if they need to call a nurse, they can get someone there fairly quickly and that they are eating properly, that they're getting social contact, they're not isolated, and they're kind of living a good life for them. So what they had anticipated was a decrease in independence, and that is not the case. When you stop relying on the family to take care of you, you actually have an increase in dependence. So they they use driving Miss Daisy out in St. Albert, they, they go on outings, they can um, my mom's learned how to use Instacart uh, so they get groceries. So they're being, their independence is quite, it has increased when they had anticipated a decrease in independence. They're not driving, but he's now 92 years old. And, you know, we've talked about the golf ball car, but he, I, I think that was a hard, and I think a hard trans, transition for me as well when I have to give up my driver's license. So that, that was quite hard for him. But they, they're now, they're, they're quite happy. They're quite settled. For them, the idea of such a massive change was really hard. It took three years to get them to that realization. And they thought us as their, their children were just nagging them constantly saying, you know, he's fallen again. He's got to go. So they're feeling that pressure lifted that we're not constantly fussing and worrying about them. And did you take your medication? Did you, you know, have you seen your doctor? That kind of stuff. So it's been um, a relief for all of us, I think. And they seem to be quite happy. So that's the good thing. So what did, the other thing is, what did we learn? 
downsize before you move. My husband and I have talked to it. I'm 60 and we're going to downsize to a small house soon, uh, probably the next two or three years. And I just realized we, we're them, right? Ooh, I don't want to give that up. This is really nice. The, my daughter drew this out, out of macaroni when she was in kindergarten. I don't want to give that up. But some of that stuff's really got to go. It's it's a lot of work. So if, whether it's for yourself or you're looking to help someone move, it takes months of prep. It's not just, okay, we're going to move in six months, we're going to move. There's a lot of work, a lot of work to be done in terms of the research, looking into places, visiting places, then go, actually doing the physical move. That that picture of the boxes on top of, uh, on top of a person at the beginning there, that's what it felt like, an overwhelming amount of stuff that we needed to take care of and a lot of work. Now, letting go is really hard for them. And most sons and daughters or family members or sisters or brothers or friends who's helping somebody through this, it is really hard to um, work through the process with them and not put your emotions into it. And shift it to an empathetic view is like, what are they going through right now? Because sons and daughters know the best for their parents. You need to get in a place that's got nurses. You So we, it was sort of letting, if we thought it was letting go, it was hard for us to, it was really hard for them to let go of that piece of their life. It, so it's not just about moving. It was about that part where we are homeowners, we are, you know, we, we're independent in this house. So th I think for them over that, that three-year period was a grieving period, right? Well, first it was that whole thing about, you know, denial, anger, all that. They went through all those phases to get them to the point where their acceptance is like, we need to do this for our own safety. Um, we need to do that. So it's really hard for them to let go of that piece of their life. The other piece is they needed to, we understood after that change is good, right? We get stuck. And so some of those things got unstuck because of the move. Stuck was, I'm going to drive my car to the grocery store every day. The unstuck change is good is like, now I can get on my iPad or my groceries, they deliver it to the building and I'm good to go. The next piece is do it before you need it, because that is the piece I learned here at Ashbourne. Often people come to us and they are in hospital, are about to be discharged, and they can't go home. So do it before you need it. Don't wait until you, something happens that you can't return to your home or you, you, whoever, your, your spouse or whatever can't take care of you. So do it before you need it because when it happens that you have to go now, it takes away choice. So if you're in the hospital, you've had a, a, a you know a fairly significant fall and you have to go and you can't go home, then choices are your choices are much more limited. So do it before you need it. Pick where you want to go, decide and start downsizing. The other thing is is to be picky. So what what uh, they they were picky where they needed to live to meet their needs and not mine. So I had in my head as executive director, you need this, this, and this, but what did they really need in the end? What did they need? Not what I needed as a daughter. What did they as a, a couple need um, in their life? And so they needed a place that looked fancy. They needed a place that had um, napkins, linen napkins and things like that. For them, it was a sense of security or, or what made them feel good. We also, my sister and I um, often got into little battles a little and what I had to keep reminding her is listen to what they're saying to you because we stopped listening as daughters we kept going okay we need to do this this and we're going to take him here we're going to take him here we're going to here and we stopped listening to him because we thought we knew better than they did what they wanted and needed which was not true um but we needed to learn we learned that we didn't listen to them as well and I kept saying to my sister have you asked mom and Doug if this is what they want well no but this is what they have you asked them that so involving them in the whole process and, and getting their opinion was we were so wrapped up in making this happen for them and as quickly as we could that we forgot to go back and consult with them and um we took on a parent role <laughs> my mom would say to my to me your sister she's so bossy and i'm sure she said to my sister well Lori, she's so bossy and so it was at one point we sort of said i said 
said to my said, we got to stop doing this. You have to present them with the options and say, what do you think about this? Rather than saying, I'm taking you here and we're going here. We're going to look at this place and this is what you're going to do. So we really learned that we need to step back and be in a support role and not a parent role, which we did. Our, our bad. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where it left us. We we all came out well in the end. They're happy where they're at, although they do complain about the food sometimes or some guy, you know, not wearing the proper clothes to the dining room or so forth. But nothing, nothing serious. And they seem to be quite happy with their lifestyle. So that is kind of our experience as it is. And so I'm happy to take questions. And that's 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 our, our dirty laundry. There you go. All right. Thank you, Lori. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Lori? I see Karen has her hand up. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, making like a parent reminds me of a situation. Um, there were times when I tried to do too much and my wife would say, there's a difference between mother and smother. Mm. <laughs> and, I like that. And it, when you think of smother, it says, oh, that's not good. <laughs> and you learn to back off and realize, oh, no, I, I really have to uh, negotiate more and, instead of just making a, independently doing, doing too much. Uh, or for that matter, putting yeah. the onus on being asked, would you do this for me or would you do that for me? As opposed to, I'm going to do that for you. No, I didn't ask you to do that. You're smothering me. So yeah, it's got to cross immediately. Like, you know, yeah, okay. So, yeah, well, so making decisions with and not for, right? And so um, we thought, well, they finally agreed to move. So now let's go. We got to do it. We got to do it. We got this skill. And it's like, we forgot to ask them, do you want to go here and look at this? And like, so it was, yeah. And my mom's very sweet and she'll not say much, but then not follow through. So then we know she didn't like the decision. So, yeah. Thanks, Karen. I see uh, we have some hands up, but in the chat, Lori, a couple people have asked for that checklist. So okay. uh, that's uh, Roy and Elvin and Sydney. So, okay. Can uh, I share that with you, Anne? Uh, sorry, no. Jan, can I say it with you, Jan, and you can distribute it or? Absolutely. Be happy yeah. to do that. Okay. I can do that for sure. I see Eric has his hand up. Go ahead, Eric. So I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. When I I did do as a, a gig as housing coordinator at SAGE, helping people find the right place, not as an intensive process because I wasn't a family member, but going through a process of helping people just asking questions. And one of the things I used to always say is that we can't predict the future, but if it's possible, um, move two years before you need to. Uh, because again, the choices, you know, there might be a six month or an eight month waiting list for the place that you really like. Well, if you if you apply, you know, in advance, then then that's fine. But the other thing is start downsizing two years before you plan on moving. And so I'm now going through that process. And I just want to uh, say to people like that emotional part, you know, I, I've now this summer, an hour a week devoted to doing some downsizing, and that's going to increase over the winter time when I have some more time available. But the whole thing about going through something and finding a little knickknack or a ticket stub and saying, oh, wow, Finding this made me remember this event that happened 55 years ago. If I didn't come across this, would I still have that memory? And it's really, you know, it's it's a process that you need to go through. And that's why it can magically move overnight from the discard box to the save box. And we don't know how that happens. Anyways, those are just my experiences in it. But thank you so much, Lori. And yes, uh, so I know it was uh, Sydney who was on the iPad. So we'll make sure that we get those uh, uh, that checklist out to everybody. Yeah. If you'll send it along to either Jan or myself afterwards. Uh, uh, thanks, Larry. Lori. Yeah. A couple of things I just want to add because onto you, it's not just a, a 
the physical act of moving. It is an emotional piece for us as children and also for them. So being prepared for what's going to bubble up while you're going through this is uh, interesting. The other piece I didn't, I've forgotten, I had it on the here, just, just when you're looking, make sure you budget in 5% increase on average that places will increase your rent. It doesn't always, but my, my folks found a place that was sort of near the top of their budget. And so as siblings, we need to step back and said, in a year or two from now, are we willing to supplement their rent? So just, sorry, I missed that part. That was fairly important. Not everybody has that, so, okay. Roy, you have a comment or a question for Lori? Yes, thank you. I was very interested in the budgeting piece of your discussions with your parents because mm -hmm. I know from a personal experience that people are 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 saying, although they can they know they can afford it, why would I pay thirty six hundred dollars when I don't pay that today uh, to make this move? And that's one of the biggest uh, boundaries I found that is just making them understand that they don't have to leave everything to their kids and their grandkids, but rather to use some of the money on themselves because they own the place that they're in today. Its value is whatever it is, and they can amply afford the move, but they don't want to spend the money on themselves. They want to keep it hoarded so that there'll be a windfall at the end. So I'm wondering how did you convince your parents to put themselves first and not think of what they what they were going to leave their kids. Uh, that's a that's a really good question because we did struggle with that, Roy. One of the things was we're all all as we're all working and various you know none of us are lined up at the food bank, so we didn't need financial assistance and we it did take them some convincing to do that. And one of the things we did was say enjoy like you still got you can still go out and about enjoy enjoy but it, that again was a three-year process well what if we do this what if we do that no just you go they they're not ones that had so before moving into the bungalow which we bought for them and they were sort of rented from us they had a condo and so they were sitting on a lot of equity and that they their condo fees kept going up so we said to them sell the condo Move insured park so we can take care of you. And they were okay with that move, except they brought a lot of stuff. But they, uh, when they moved in, they had their equity and we said, use it. So they went on a cruise. They had bought the car that turned into a golf ball. And then, but they had leading up to that, the eight years, they, because they, we knew that physically, eventually wouldn't be able to do that. So they went on a holiday to Florida and we said, go. And so they they spent their equity before they moved into the seniors' residence. So now they're working just on their pensions. He worked with Sincrude, mom worked for government, so they're okay. Now the other piece of that, which I think is another good question, is why would you pay thirty five hundred dollars? When we sit, we sat down with them and looked at what they were spending in terms of utilities, car insurance, gas, groceries. We actually did a breakdown with them and said, okay, this is what your rent's gonna cost, but this includes your Wi-Fi, your cable, your electricity, your power, someone to pick you up off the floor as you're rolling around laughing on the floor. So all these different things that they would get for that. But what they saw was the $3,000. Mm -hmm. What they didn't do is make a comparison to what they were already spending and what things they would not have to spend money on. So convincing them to give up the car and take taxis was, but taxis are expensive. Yeah, so is car insurance and gas and dealing with all the repair bills as you bang into things all the time. So we really did a, we did a comparison with them, what that bought you, what that $3,000 bought you. I mean, you can get, I'm not joking, $6,000 for a, an apartment somewhere um, in a senior's residence. So you got to figure out. So they they let go of that idea that they needed to leave something in their will. And so, and we're all okay with that. So. Yeah. 
Joan. Uh, yeah, hi, Lori. Uh, thanks so much for your personal presentation. It was so funny and factual and very helpful. Um, Good. It's very personal for you, and I really appreciate you sharing. But I, And I was wondering, you had mentioned that this place that um, Doug and Esther chose were would not necessarily be your choice. And um, just are you able to share, like, why you wouldn't have picked it or... Yes, some ideas. <laughs> I can. So, but that's my personal bias, and so that please don't take this as uh, you know advice sure. if you're looking or helping someone to look. So for me, I'm a nonprofit girl, right? So I I've worked in not for profit, and I've also spent two years stint in a for profit uh, seniors residence, being the executive director there, and I just think that not-for-profits and for-profits spend their money differently in terms of any profit that's made in a not-for-profit actually goes back into the building. In a for-profit, there is that need. It's it's a business. I mean, we're still a business. We need to stay viable. But the business in a for-profit is different in the sense that they're planning their next building. So the profit goes there. So that's, that's my personal bias. My, my folks love it there. Would I choose it? I think I, I, and so I'll tell you an interesting thing about that building. So one of the things I'm very uh, picky about for me, organizations that um, embrace diversity and inclusion, and I didn't get that sense when they were moving into Chartwell, but I'm going to tell you a little something that's quite good. I've been approached by one of their staff to help them work on making it more inclusive. So yay them that made yeah. me happy that wasn't happening when they moved in so again that's a very white caucasian building um not that that's a problem for them or but i just needed to for me i would choose a place that had a little bit more um diversity training around diversity that kind of stuff so that would be location my sister never told me she was leaving for six months out of every year and so where they were six minutes away before they are now 30 minutes away and that when even when even with them living there there's still things that we need to attend to help them get to doctor's appointments because my mom doesn't hear very well um they electronics are a massive pain in the butt with them they keep locking themselves out of their phones and ipads and anyway so does that answer your question john yeah you bet and also do they provide types of home care in this facility or is that like independent of the facility itself no they they have their and that was pretty important to me too uh that's a good a good point they have home care in the building so you get the same although they're my mom and um stepdad are not using home care right right now except when they when they fall down uh but generally they're still able to take their own medications although she doesn't do it well uh, at some point, we're going to have to convince them that they need to get someone to help manage their medications because my mom is diabetic and has high blood pressure. So she's not doing well with their diabetes medication. But one thing at a time, one thing at a time, right? So, Thank but you. They, yeah. But that makes a difference, right? Is it the same person that's coming in helping you have a shower every day, or is a different company coming in and you don't know the person giving? Because there's right. quite intimate home care can be quite intimate. And so that was important too. Sydney, I see you put a couple of comments in the chat. Do you, did you want to speak about downsizing? There we there go. We go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, as a, a person who's downsized now three times, um, uh, it's a one of the things that really helps me is regifting. My kids are wonderful, and they give me the most wonderful stuff. And more and more of it wrapped up and in Christmas presents, they're just, I have the best kids in the world. However, at this stage, most of us want a little more experience and a little less stuff. So I find uh, one of my habits is to try and re-gift things to everybody uh, slowly so they don't just think I'm trying to get rid of my junk. Maybe there's a memory <laughs> tied to it or whatever. And I do tell them what the memory is and if it's precious to them to keep it and if it's not to throw it out. Um, but um, 
and uh, I mean, I do have one funny story. I gave my grandson this beautiful set of Eagles DVDs that someone had given me years ago. My grandson still, one of them, still likes DVDs and sort of collects them. And I was so proud, it was in great condition, you know, it, it had not been used. Um, and uh, when he opened the box, there were no DVDs in it. <laughs> I, had, I had recycled them already. So that's my little story. So sometimes when you re-gift, you really have to check carefully that perfect box that you thought would be perfect for that perfect person. Yeah. Well, my mom had lots. They used to go out quite a lot. They belonged to the um, Scottish Society and they went out dinner dances. And so she had quite a lot of nice sort of more formal outfits. And she kept saying, Lori, do you want this one? This would this would be good on you. And I'm like, hmm, I don't really want to wear my 87 year old mother's clothing. It's not to my taste. We are very different. But she couldn't she could not get her head around. Well, I wouldn't want that Tanjay outfit um or whatever it was because she's just like well it will it will you might you could get it taken in or it'll fit you or whatever it's like mom I don't want your clothes <laughs> my sisters are tall and I'm closer to my mom's height so she kept trying to give them to me sometimes you don't want that stuff Lori I had a question um I wonder if you could talk more about and I don't know if that the right language you said a personal care like I'm, I'm thinking you were saying you can pay someone's time to, you know, take you grocery shopping or um, do things that aren't medical. Um, it, yes. Is that service out there? And how would yes. I access that so if I wanted someone to cut my lawn? <laughs> yes, you would just have to. I mean, so within within certain buildings, and I and I don't know about. Uh, chart well because it's never really come up but within Ashbourne you can we can hire out companion care so one of our staff can go so we have a, a lady here who likes to go clothes shopping but she uses a walker and so she needs help to go so they will she can hire a staff on an hourly rate to go with her and help her pick clothing we also we have a driver here at Ashbourne who um we have a bus and a car, so she will take people shopping and help them with their bags, or she will shop for them. So if they say, I need this, when she's out running about, they give her a list and she will shop for them. So either way, so yeah, so there's companion care, which is someone doesn't need to be qualified in a sort of a medical capacity as a health care aide or an LPN, or if you have someone coming in, the personal care piece is help showering help with your support stocking medications those kind of things so either one is possible thank you yeah um eric you have your hand up yeah just two uh, a couple of quick comments one is about regifting. um i love the idea of regifting because i i give it and i say you can do with this whatever you wish. So I've taken care of this precious memory. I've handed it on to somebody else. If they decide they want to throw it away, that's not my problem. <laughs> you know, so a very, very good thing. Uh, the other is that just to say through, uh, yes, companion care is available. You can have somebody come in and play cribbage once a week or coffee or that sort of thing. For things around the home, uh, through the Edmonton Seniors Coordinating Council, they maintain a list of vetted service providers like plumbers and landscapers and those sorts of things. And those names, they still have to charge because they those people have to make a living and, and earn money for their family. But they, the fact that they've been vetted through Better Business Bureau and referrals is, and they have insurance and liability insurance and all the rest of it, that can be helpful if somebody's looking for that type of thing around the house. And the last thing is I recommend everybody sit down and just write down just so that you have it for your own. You know, my condo fees are $600 a month. My property tax is $300 a month. My utilities are costing me $400 a month. It's pretty easy to see exactly what your position is, but we're set. The problem is you're spending it one piece at a time instead of as a lump sum, which is exactly what uh, Lori was saying. Yeah. Those were just my my comments. Thanks. Yeah, you'd be surprised what we do with my parents. They're like, oh, oh, we're spending that much, and this is the rent. Yeah, and that having to worry about bill paying and 
all that kind of stuff. It all went online, right? All the bill paying, all that stuff goes online. And they were having a struggle like, I need to go to the bank to pay my electrical bill. Well, you can't drive. So how do you do that? So it was even just freeing up that piece of their time was not having to worry about bill payments and going to the bank or, or you know, wherever to pay their bills. So the interesting thing, and, 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 and you're not going to like what I'm going to say, but that regifting piece as a daughter, it's really hard because then, you, you know, they give you this and then you don't want to throw it out. I mean, it's good to say, and sometimes I don't want it. So we had a, my, my sister-in-law, her, her father moved in. And I don't remember, do you remember the photos that have the, they have these children with the very large eyes? It's a French artist. Is, is anybody, is it know who I'm talking about? So her, her dad gifted those to his daughters, precious to him not precious to her. That's not her style. So she came to our house and said, oh, maybe Lori, you want this. And she gave it to me. I didn't want it either, but I took it because now it gets wrapped up every second Christmas or birthday and she gets it back. Or I go visit them in the house and I'll take down a picture in her bathroom and hang that one up and just, oh, Lori, you did it again. So this picture nobody actually wanted is now kind of a little bit of a fun thing that happens and it's getting bouncing between houses. But regifting works sometimes if the person wants it. You just need to be tough to say when your daughter says, mom, I don't want that outfit, that she's not hurt because it was to her taste. And so that that's the part you got to, you have to have a thick skin when you try to give stuff away to hear that nobody wants your precious treasures. She collects Hummel, if you know what that is, like the Hummel. And my, my stepdad collected for years and probably had 200 plates like you hang on the wall that he said are worth a fortune, but they're not. Nobody wants them. And he was hurt that nobody wanted his precious collection. And so they're in boxes somewhere. So anyways. So we're down to our last two minutes, Lori. Um, I think I'd like to give you the final word if you have any uh, last words for us or any events that you want to advertise before we close off here. I don't think I have any events. I just really appreciate you listening to me rambling on. And um, just so you know that it's a tough go to make this big a move into a senior's residence. It actually is. And I hope that, and I can't imagine somebody who doesn't have family around, you know, going through that process would be even more difficult, but it's definitely worth it. They're, they're happy. They, if you'd ask them a year before they moved, are they going to be happy? They say, no, we're we just doing it because you told us to do it. But now they're, they're settled and happy and as we would want. So, yeah, don't be afraid. It's all good. If there's anything I can do to help, if anybody is looking and needs, uh, you know, um, a little bit help. I will get that checklist out to right after. I will get it to um, Jan there and uh, she can share it with you and you can line your birdcage or you can use it. So anyways, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Wonderful, Lori. Um, if you need to reach us, you can reach us at agingwithprideyeg at gmail.com. See you all next week. Thanks, Aging with Pride. <laughs>